Good morning, Clint. Good morning. All right. Well, welcome to Saving Grace Bible Church. We've got a full house this morning, which is fantastic. If you are uh, visiting with us, and I just waited to find your seats, but if you're visiting with us, please raise your hand high. One of our men is coming down the aisle. He would like to give you a little information about the church, about our ministries and history. And if you would, again, just raise those high. If you did not get win on the way in. All right. Thank you, Jim. Okay, so it's been a great week. We had uh, vacation Bible school this week. Pilgrim's Progress was the theme. I wasn't able to see all of it, but I did see the uh, opening night. I got to see the closing night, and the kids did a, a fantastic job, and all the volunteers as well. So I want to thank everybody who was involved with that. You did great work, and um, also just a, a fantastic opportunity to shape these kids with uh, Pilgrim's Progress, which, as Eric pointed out, I think is the second most popular Christian book uh, second to the Bible. So, good job on that. Uh, just a few announcements. Marriage conference is coming up. A reminder of that, that's July 21st through 23rd. There are still spots available. And uh, if you have not signed up for that, I want to encourage you to do so. If you have not planned on going that, again, I want to encourage you to do so. That's going to be a great time with Todd Murray. And uh, actually, my wife, Kristen, is in the foyer, or she will be in the foyer at the end of the service. And uh, you can just be assisted in signing up there. So if you would just see her. And as always, the fellowship hall is open. We have live stream going on there with the sermon. So that if you have a little one with you that is uh, getting unsettled, you can just slip out and, and go in. There's coffee and just an opportunity to sit in a, a relaxed environment and hear the word of God preached. So if you would, let's go ahead and uh, open in prayer. Lord, how blessed we are to be your people. You called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. You made us alive and gave us hearts of flesh to replace our hearts of stone. And you enlighten our minds to know truth and enable us to walk in it. We come before you this morning in need of your wisdom. We come in need of reminding, of instruction, of correction and repentance. And we ask, Lord, that through the preaching of your word this morning and through the ministrations of your people, that we would, each and every one of us, be pierced by the truth, convicted of sin, strengthened in our weaknesses, and further transformed into the likenesses of your Son. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we uh, begin with worship, we actually have a little treat for you. Speaking of VBS, we have the children, or some of the children who were in Vacation Bible School. They're going to come up now, and they are going to sing a little song. And I will stand up here and stare at you while I wait for them to come in. <laughs> They're coming. All right. Come on up, guys. It's okay. All right. Here come the children. And I know they have practiced hard, and this is, I heard this song. This is a great song, you guys, so we're looking forward to this. So I am going to go ahead and close down, and I'll let you guys take over.
All right. What a great morning, huh? Little ones there singing, and I know all week long that they were preparing. And we'll actually have a chance after uh, the service today to sing that same song, reflecting on the truths presented there. Uh, This morning now, let's uh, turn our attention to the reading of God's Word. Please stand as we read from Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, starting in verse 16, through the end of the chapter, here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the church. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image of in the form of corruptible man 
and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desires towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. But being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. And all they, although they knew God, or they know of the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hardly approval to those who practice them. Indeed, the words, as Paul began that whole writing, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Oh, how we need his gospel. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and just reading the accounts of your words about the heart of man, we can see that heart in us. We can see the lies. We can see the rebellion, the self-will, the self-seeking. We can see the malicious gossiping. We can see the evil desires within. And we recognize, indeed, our hearts are evil. But indeed, what joy it is to know that there is the gospel of God, a gospel which saves, a gospel which restores, a gospel which gives us hope. We would pray that we would not be ashamed of your gospel, not ashamed of your power, of your wisdom, of your truth, that you've come to rescue sinners, to call them to salvation in Christ Jesus, that you've given us a way of escape, a way of hope, a way of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. We come this morning collectively as your redeemed people to gather together corporately to praise your name, to demonstrate the unity in our midst which exists around the gospel of Christ, a unity which is manifested as we minister the word, as we encourage one another, as we obey your truth, as we submit our wills to all you've called us to do. We come this morning to reflect upon you, For indeed, you have revealed yourself in creation. You have demonstrated your your grand power, your marvelous wisdom, your unsearchable knowledge is all demonstrated in creation. We see the vastness of your power as we see the scope and the length of of eternity of of the heavens. We we see the intricate detail that you have down to the smallest creature and even the smallest atom. Father, we, we pray in all of this that we would bow our knee in humble submission to you, that we would yield uh, our own hearts as we recognize that uh, your law is written on our hearts. We would pray then, in all of this, that as we come to Christ Jesus, that we would exalt him as our Lord and Savior and proclaim to all that they too can have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this wonderful joy. For indeed, our soul arises to give you praise this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I have the first two parts of the sermon done properly today. I managed to make it up here without stumbling. So I pray that you'll pray for me as I share from the word that I won't stumble from the pulpit. And I managed to get the uh, microphone on. 
You know, I feel uh, that I understand a little bit what Pastor Mark and Pastor Eric face when they come up here following our wonderful worship, and I have to say a special thank you to Mark today for letting me follow the kids. I mean, it's kind of hard to top that when you think about what it is we do. But we're going to try to do that this morning by sharing from God's Word, and uh, it really is with, uh, with pleasure and, and, and privilege that uh, I occupy the pulpit this week, and Lord willing, for the next two weeks. Uh, Over the course of these three weeks, what we're going to do is fully and deeply explore Psalm 19. But before I say a word about that, what I want to do is start with a word of thanksgiving, and I want to give a word of thanks to this congregation, the body itself, and the leaders of the body. The last um, 18, uh, not 18, but eight months or so in China was really a very difficult time for Katie and myself. We faced a, a serious challenge in the church where we serve. Uh, It was a challenge that uh, was divisiveness, so uh, Colin shared with us about that today in Sunday school, but it ultimately led us to a need to have to administer church discipline. Now, church discipline in and of itself is a difficult thing to do, but a necessary thing that the Bible calls us to, but it was particularly hard in our case for three reasons. One, this church of about 400 people has never taught on the concept of church discipline. And like many churches that are growing in their doctrinal faith, they thought God is only love. Secondly, the leaders themselves uh, had never really deeply studied this topic, and now they were faced with administering it. And most of all, their coach, me, had never been through it before. So I want to thank, first of all, both the pastors and the elders of the church because they were able to coach me from a long distance. And uh, in that coaching, they helped me come to the scriptures and understand how we should administer and, and deliver this process. And then I also want to thank everybody here that I know have been praying for us and uh, praying that uh, God would uh, have his will know, made known and shown in this process. And praise the Lord, it, it did work out well in the end. It, it did result in a, in a bit of a division in the church where some members went and began their own church. But by and large, the church held together. So I don't want to say a lot more about that this morning, but I do want to say a very, very deep and heartfelt thank you to everybody here. You know, people will often ask us as missionaries, do we feel uh, your prayers and, and, and do they matter? And, and the truth of the fact is that, that they do. They really, really do. And I, and I can't really describe to you what the feeling is. Um, uh, you know, I can't really uh, completely put into words. Maybe it's nothing more than just knowing that people here know and are aware of us and are praying for us, and that's important. But I can tell you that they are very deeply felt, and they do make a difference. So again, I want to thank you for that. And I want to ask you to keep praying, if you would, while we're back here in the States, for the leaders of the church. Uh, While it was difficult for Katie and I to go through this process, it was really traumatic for them. And they got pounded by some men that were just... uh, Disappointing is probably the kindest word that I can say. Some men that are real spiritual giants in China. And they were just wrong. But these men stood with the scriptures. They stood hard in the face of being challenged. They stood hard in the face of the trial. And God, in his grace, did bring them through it in the end. So we were encouraged by that. uh, And pray for them, please, as they continue to heal in this process, uh, as they begin to to, to explore the, the, the idea of forgiveness, which they have to explore in this process, and as they also have to continue to shepherding the sheep, which is a tall order. So with that, let me kind of turn our attention back to uh, Psalm 19. And I've got to confess, when uh, Pastor Mark told me I'd have the opportunity to preach for three whole weeks in a row, I had big plans. (laughs) And uh, I was going to preach on Psalm 19 in its entirety this week. I would have killed you all with that. And then I was going to jump into Psalm 119, and we're going to talk about that. But God, in his grace, as I began my study, quickly disabused me of that and said, you are trying to do way, way too much. So what we're going to do here over these three weeks is we are going to slow down and we're going to take a very deep look at this mountain of a psalm. And uh, Lord willing, we'll look at the three parts. Now, let me begin then with a quick roadmap for what we'll do here in these three weeks. One commentator that I like introduces Psalm 19 this way. He says that the Psalm 19's theology is as powerful as its poetry. And we're really going to see that as we go through there. I could not more fully agree. Certainly, all of Scripture contains doctrinal truth about God, but Psalm 19 is, particularly, is a particularly concentrated proclamation uh, of God's attributes. Grammatically, the psalm breaks down into two parts. The first part focuses on God's self-revelation, I mean, God's self-disclosure 
in creation are what theologians call natural or uh, general revelation. And the second focuses on God's self-disclosure in Scripture. Again, what the theologians call special revelation. And while both of these doctrines are equally true, they're not equally important. Uh, general revelation convicts us of sin, but special revelation both convicts and saves. And we'll learn a little bit more about this distinction as we move through the psalm. Now, while grammatically two parts, what I would like you to see as we unfold this par- powerful psalm is that there are really three distinct themes that David deals with and that emerge from these twin th- t- towers of theology. So if you're taking notes today, and I hope you will, uh, you might want to write these down because they will be our outline for this and the next two Sundays. <clears throat> the first theme that David introduces and the subject of our message this week, I've called the unspoken word of God's created world. Let me say that again so you have a chance to write it down. The unspoken word of God's created world. And we find this in verses 1 through 6. Um, uh, This is uh, God's self-disclosure to all people spanning all of human history. And from Scripture, we know that God's general revelation, as Mark read in the passage from Romans this morning, uh, cannot save us, but it most definitely can convict us of sin, and specifically the sin of rejecting God. Now, the second theme is the spoken word of God's written scriptures, found in verses 7 to 11. So the spoken word of God's written scriptures. This is God's special revelation to all people given to us in the Bible. In contrast to general revelation, special revelation both convicts us of our sin and can, I underline the word can, lead people to salvation. We'll tackle this next week. And then the final theme I've called the penitent word of God's chosen people. And this emerges in the final three verses of the psalm. Being penitent simply means feeling sorrow uh, or regret for having done wrong. By extension, then, a penitent person is someone who repents of his wrongdoings. We in the church call this sin and seeks forgiveness from God. And I can't really think of a better or more acceptable response to what we're going to learn about God's revelation in the first 11 verses than this response that we're going to see from David in the last three verses of the psalm. So from these three themes, the unspoken word of God's created world, the spoken word of God's written scriptures, and the penitent word of God's chosen people, let me give you um, the main theme or propose the main theme of the psalm, and it's simply this. God's revelation demands our penitent response. So Psalm 19, you might say it this way, is all about God's divine revelation and mankind's acceptable response to that divine revelation. Now, with that roadmap in mind, I want to pause for just a few minutes here and insert a short tutorial on how we read and understand Hebrew poetry. Since much of the Old Testament is given to us in the poetical genre, I hope this will help you not only today as we go through this marvelous psalm, but also as you read some of the other poetical books in the Old Testament. Psalm 19, like much of the Old Testament, is given to us in the poetic genre, meaning the style of writing. And we see this in our English Bibles, typically by how the translators (coughs) format the text. Um, like other poetical books, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, and big parts of the large, uh, large parts of the major and minor prophets, uh, much of the Old Testament is given to us in poetry, and we recognize it by this offset formatting, which is quite different from the typical block text that we see when we're reading narrative. But really more important than the format is the fact that Hebrew poetry itself is quite different from the poetry that we're probably familiar with. So the quick lesson is going to be the lesson in the way that I learned it, and we're going to use an acronym called PIC, the letters P-I-C. And from these, uh, these letters of this acronym, we're going to be able to observe some key features of this wonderful form of communication. Now, PIC stands for parallelism, imagery, and conciseness. Okay, so the first and most fundamental feature of Hebrew, Hebrew poetry is parallelism, 
which deals with the relationships between the lines of poetry. Now, it's either between the lines of each verse or it may be between the lines of the different verses of poetry. And there are three primary types of parallelism that you see. The first is called synonymous parallelism. And in this case, what we see is that the second line of a verse is going to restate an idea or a thought from the first line using different, different but equivalent words. So you're going to see the same thought repeated. It's kind of a form of emphasis as you're looking at the two lines of the verse. The second form is called synthetic parallelism. And what this does is simply adds an additional thought to the first line. So the first line will state something, and then the second line will add some more information about what was stated in the first line. And then the final form is what is called antithetical parallelism. And in this form of parallelism, the second line is going to present a contrast to what is said in the first line. And this contrast is going to help us draw out additional meaning. Now, in our text today, we'll see the first form right away in verse 1. Uh, you can see synthetic parallelism in verse 13. And then in verses 2 and 3, we see just a beautiful example of how antithetical parallelism works. Now, the second feature is imagery. Uh, imagery is a major, major uh, a focus of Hebrew poetry, and it's simply the use of figurative language. It also occurs in other types of literature in the, New Testament, in the Old Testament, but it's much more widespread in poetry. Images help make Hebrew poems very compact. It helps make them short and concise because they convey, convey a great deal of information with an economy of words. Using imagery, what the writer's trying to do is to paint a word picture that is loaded with the meaning that he wants to share with us. In fact, you've been seeing this in the New Testament as Pastor Mark has led us through the parables of Jesus in Matthew 13. Jesus' parables use imagery. They use pictures, common everyday pictures and things that people can observe to convey deep spiritual and doctrinal truths. So you'll see this a lot in the Psalms. Um, perhaps the easiest way to describe imagery is kind of with a common idiom a common phrase that we use when we're marveling at a painting or maybe a beautiful scenery. And I'll bet everybody has done this when they're looking at it. How many times can you remember saying, wow, a picture is worth a thousand words? And this is really what's happening in poetry. They're painting a picture, and that picture is going to bring to mind words and images and feelings that help us understand. It's very emotive in the process. But even more... What it causes us to do is think hard about what he's trying to say, what the writer's trying to say. What is he saying in the image? And we should meditate on that. So we're going to encounter this uh, thinking aspect of imagery when we take a look at uh, verses 4 to 6 today. Uh, and imagery is indeed used to, to make a very vivid and, and memorable thoughts in our minds. So just take Psalm 42 and verse 1 as an example. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. So comparisons, vivid imagery. Or an even more well-loved verse, Psalm 23, we probably all know this first one by heart, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So before I leave this, uh, this discussion, though, on, on um, imagery, I do want to make one dogmatic statement about the use of imagery in the Bible. It is never intended never intended to be empty-headed feelings. It's not intended to make you feel things that don't lead you to biblical truth. So as we will see in this marvelous psalm, these images are going to lead us to deep theological truth, and it's going to lead us to how God reveals himself through the images of nature in our lesson today. Now the final feature of Hebrew poetry is conciseness. And this simply means that they say a lot of things with a few words. They do this frequently by dropping words. Now, we won't get into this much here. You can really only see it in the original language. But you'll know it's happening if your Bibles are faithful when you see italicized words in the text. That means that the English translators are supplying a word. But again, because they drop words, the intention 
for the Hebrew reader who would be to naturally think through what words or what thoughts the writer wants us to supply through this very terse form of communication. So remember the acronym as we go through here, PIC, Parallelism, Imagery, and Conciseness. Hebrew poetry seeks to create a picture. I learned that too. That's cute. It's a picture, okay, that communicates the writer's meaning to the reader. Now, with this very quick tutorial in mind, let's uh, turn our attention back to the text and let me read the first six verses of this, uh, this wonderful psalm from David. He begins, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance, utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of, of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. <clears throat> There's a wonderful twist of irony, I think, in these first six verses. The very creation that God speaks into existence, remember Genesis, and God said, is itself an unspoken revelation of God. So the very creation spoken into existence is the unspoken revelation of God. Or as the theologians again call it general revelation, the point of this opening section is to say that God is announcing himself. He's revealing himself continuously and relentlessly and boldly and marvelously and abundantly without saying a word. In these six verses, David's going to tell us that creation announces and reveals the creator in two ways. In verse, starting in verse 1 and through the first two lines of verse 4, God's unspoken word speaks through the canvas of the sky. And then in the last line of verse 4 through verse 6, God's unspoken word speaks through the radiance of the sun. In some fashion, everything that God has created points to him and explains who he is. To use a principle from our own philosophy of ministry here at Saving Grace, God's creation exposits him. All the various parts of creation, and particularly us, since we are created in his image, contribute to the very picture of who God is. So let's take a closer look at these two images that David has chosen to exegete our wonderful God, the skies and the sun. Now, as I'm describing uh, these two showcases, I want you to think about the common thread between the two, between the heavens and the sun. As I get to verse 4, you'll have the time to think about that. So, from the inscription of the psalm, we learn two things. The inscriptions, what are usually in, in italics at the top of your psalm, is actually part of the actual psalm in the Hebrew text. It's the first verse. And it says, for the choir director, a psalm of David. And we learn two things from that. First, many of the psalms played a part in Israel's musical worship, meaning they were sung. And this should not be a big surprise because the Apostle Paul tells us much the same thing in the book of Ephesians in chapter 5 and verse 9 when he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Now we're not told what the, uh, when the religion, a religious occasion of the psalm was used, but we are told that King David is the author. Now, King David was, as you recall from the Old Testament, first a shepherd boy. So as a shepherd, he would have lived out in nature, experiencing the canvas of the sky, both the daytime sky and the nighttime sky. And then later, as he was fleeing from King Saul, he was living outside in the wilderness and in caves. So David was really in a very perfect place, and it shouldn't be a big surprise to us that he would pen uh, such high praise for the creation. Now, in verse 1, David introduces the psalm by extolling, that is, enthusiastically in praising God 
for his work in creation. And he starts by pointing to the heavens and the expanse. Two pretty obvious clues, I think, that David is speaking about creation. Now, if you doubt me, uh, we can quickly remember the opening words of the Bible. What does it say? In the beginning, God. That's a good starting point, right? But what does he do? Creates the heavens and the earth, okay? And then he goes on in verse six is in, in verses 6 to 8 of Genesis, and we learn that he had created also the expanse, and he put the expanse to separate the waters, the waters from above from the waters below. So it's pretty clear that David is talking about creation here. Um, he's, but he's talking about aspects of the creation that is the observable sky. It's not the heavens where God resides, and they're always worshiping and glorifying him, but it's the heavens that we can observe, the sky that we see all around us. And we can see it with our naked eye. Uh, he asserts in this first verse that the skies tell us of God's glory and the work of his hands declares the expanse. And I think what he's doing here is communicating God's intimate involvement in creation. He shaped it with his very hands. Now, some commentators key on the word glory in the first line of verse 1, and they take the focus of the psalm to be God's glory in both general and special revelation. Now, in no way do I want to stand here and deny God's glory, nor do I want to diminish God's glory or the fact that we should glorify him. But I do want to say that I don't think glory alone, or even primarily, is David's pri primary focus here in the psalm. Instead, David is interested in expressing what the heavens and the expanse reveal about God. The heavens, like every aspect of creation, and everything God does is intimately to the praise of his glory. And this is not, however, the main idea here. It is really the focus on revealing who God is. You know, how wonderful that God doesn't hide himself. Quite to the contrary, he's primarily interested in revealing himself. And God is as plain to see as the canvas of the sky. What better feature of creation for David to highlight? For there's no one among us or no one among anyone from all time who hasn't been able to observe the daytime or the nighttime star, sky. By day, we can observe the chan changing canvas of the sky. Some days we wake up to beautiful blue sunny skies. Sometimes we see white puffy clouds. Other times we may see dark rain clouds. We may see God expressing himself in thunder and lightning through the sky. So he does use a little bit of sound, okay? But... Uh, in all of these things, God is revealing himself. And then by night, we experience the brilliant stars. We see constellations. Maybe we see a shooting star or perhaps an eclipse sometimes. And all of these are juxtaposed on the night sky. So our God, like both the daytime and the nighttime sky, is multifaceted, right? God's loving. God's just. Uh, God is uh, all-powerful. He's present everywhere. He knows everything, past, present, and future. And I could really go on and on because we can't really describe the indescribable. And if you think that's not true, I've kind of been doing my read through the Bible and I just got to Ezekiel yesterday. So go read the first chapter of Ezekiel and see if you can figure out how he's trying to describe exactly this marvelous grand God that he's being revealed to him. But what we're going to see here is a little bit more concrete example of that. So David's point here is that, is that the canvas of the sky uh, is a means by which God communicates. It's his handiwork. It bears his signature as sovereign artist alone. God is the ultimate object, though, of his creation because he's the creator. So it points to him, and it is his divine self-revelation. Now, in verses 2 and 3, David's going to go on, having declared that God is revealing himself in the sky... And he's going to tell us something about what it says about himself. So let me read these two verses again, just to get our thoughts back there. It says, day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. <clears throat> verses 2 and 3 form what's called a couplet. It's a pair. And they work together to communicate a single idea. And the idea here that David is communicating is simply this. God is communicating 
nonstop without saying a word. So the skies are communicating nonstop without saying a word. Now, I often smile to myself when I see an advertisement or something that promotes how some store is open 24-7, or you can get our services 24-7. There's really nothing particularly unique about that, right? I mean, God himself originated it. He's been communicating 24-7, 365 days a year, every day from the very first day that he created human history and the world itself. And he'll continue communicating nonstop through his creation until the day he returns to communicate once again in person. And that's a grand thing to think about. So he's telling about us now, but yet there's going to be a day when he's going to come back and talk to us again. And then we're going to see him face to face. So David begins in verse 2 by saying day to day, the heavens pour forth speech. The Hebrew verb that David uses here is kind of interesting. It literally means bubbling over or the idea of gushing out like a spring of water. Even more graphically, it can be translated as burping or vomiting out things. Now, pretty colorful language. I don't think he's really doing that, belching out. But the point is, it's very expressive, okay? And it's used figuratively here, uh, and it, when it is, it's often, it's often paired with speech as its object, and it conveys the idea of something gushing forth. David's point is that the heavens are communicating all day long. But there's more. It goes on night to night, so not only all day, but all night. And when we put these two ideas together, we have the concept of communicating all the time. Day, night, God's continually communicating. There's never a time that God is silent. Now, I hear people say, oh, God's not talking to me. My answer is, oh, yes, he is. Just look around. Okay? And if he's not, after you look around, then maybe look inside. There might be something you've got to deal with okay, that God wants you to deal with. But the point is God is always talking to us through his creation. But that's not all. I think it also kind of indicates through this verb the idea of abundantly. It's not just a little bit. He's not just saying, here's a snippet here and a snippet there. It's an abundant communication. It's bubbling over. It's pouring forth. It's gushing out. You know, I'm old enough that I used to watch the uh, Beverly Hillbillies. Anybody ever see the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. Up in the world came a bubbling crude. Okay, well, God's bubbling for something way more valuable than oil, right? When he communicates to us about about himself through his creation. So not a little speech, but continuous and copious speech. And all this speech is revealing knowledge. Knowledge about what? About God. Everything God creates testifies abundantly to the divine mind that lies behind all that we can observe. So as I said a little earlier, there's nothing hidden. It's right there before our eyes for us to see. Now, we come here to verse 3. You've got to say, mm-mm, uh-oh, what's happening here? After just saying that God is talking all the time, gushing forth speech and revelation about himself, David now says, paraphrasing, no speech, no words, not a sound. So what's going on? David confused? I mean, is is he contradicting himself? Of course, we know there's rhetorical questions which demand the answer, no. But the point is this. Um, These two verses are working together to convey a single idea. So the contrasting three negatives in verse 3 complete the idea from verse 2. Okay? Verse 2. God's talking all the time. Verse 3 without saying a word, not even a sound, not even an itsy-bitsy little beep, right? So the two things are working together. And yet, without saying a word, he's absolutely roaring in his communication to us. So this is a beautiful example of the antithetical parallelism that I talked to you about. It's a good way to think. You should stop and think as you see these two verses. What's going on here? He just said this, and now he contradicted himself in the second verse. Well, you put the two things together, and it's a very figurative and vivid way to express this continuous and abundant communication without saying a word. Now, this idea really shouldn't be very foreign to us, right? 
Um, I don't know how it is for some of the other men here, but have you ever seen that look in your wife's face that says, oh boy, you're in trouble. She hasn't said a word, has she? But she's revealed precisely what's on her mind. Okay, so we see it all the time. We use these signals. I remember watching, I can't remember which of the three uh, ladies it was here that gave the little tutorial about how we control the classroom, right? Quiet down, you noisy kids, or maybe <laughs> eyes on me, okay? So we use nonverbal communications all the time, all right? The heavens are providing a visual nonverbal communication about God all the time, okay? So I just love the way Charles Spurgeon puts it. He's got a wonderful set of commentaries on the Psalms, and he just has a beautiful way of saying things. What Spurgeon says is this. Words may be ignored, albeit at our peril, but the witness of the natural world cannot be silenced. I think he just captures the essence of all this right there in that beautiful little phrase. Okay, words can be ignored. I mean, you know, you parents know that, don't you? You lovely little children ignore our words all the time, right? But your silence sometimes can't be ignored. Okay, so God is communicating to us as his children in much the same way. But David's not done. We get to the first part of verse 4 here. And then the first two lines, having established that God never ceases to communicate through his creation and communicating abundantly but silently, he's now going to tell us something about the extent or the reach of God's communication. Verse 4 begins with uh, their line. Uh, some of your Bibles may say that an alternate reading is their voice. Some may even have their voice. Uh, I think their line is actually uh, is more faithful to the original Hebrew, and I think it really helps us better understand the point that he's trying to make. The idea is that it is a measuring line. God has measured off the dimensions of the heaven. He has stretched them out. There's a profound theological thought expressed in this idea, and that's namely God's immensity. So in simple terms, God is greater than anything that he creates. He's above it. He's beyond it. He's greater than it. We call that transcendence. But at the same time, he's imminent in that he is in it. Okay, Not possessed by it, but I should say with it is a better preposition for that. He is with the creation, and we see that as he expresses himself through the skies. So think about it for a minute. The heavens stretch out as far as we can see. We know there's still more that we can't see. God is yet bigger than all that, and that is, again, an expression of his transcendence. God himself measured off the heavens surrounding the earth. So I can just see him with a tape measure up there. So, yeah, we'll make it this long here and then this long here. And he just measured out the whole heavens right before us. So whether you prefer line or voice, it really doesn't disturb the meaning here or the understanding of this verse because uh, the focus is on the extent of the revelation, not the means, not how he did it, but the extent of the revelation, which is really quite clear by the two prepositional phrases at the end of each of these lines. In verse 4, he says first in the, in, in the A line that he has done this throughout all the earth, and then again in the next line to the end of the world. Now, uh, the second line represents the idea here, again, of the first line, right? It's an equivalent thought using different words. So we see an example here of how synonymous parallelism heightens or builds the idea. But the point is the reach, and the, and the point really for us is that God's communication in the skies is a universal communication, <clears throat> right? It's a universal testimony to all people everywhere. There's nowhere anywhere in the world that doesn't see the sky, right? We know that, okay? So it's a universal testimony, and God is revealing himself through what? Through the skies. In fact, the Apostle Paul cites this verse in Romans 10, verse 18, and we won't turn there, uh, and he uses it, though, as, a, as an argument for the universal nature and witness of the gospel to save. Now, I want to be clear, okay? Paul's talking about special revelation, 
the written word, the gospel. But he appeals to this psalm to tell us how universal that gospel is and its universal saving power when people respond to it in faith in Jesus Christ. We'll learn a bit more about that next week when we jump, when we jump into verses 7 to 11. And I also want to point out kind of one little minor thing here about this verse 4 and that the verb itself uh, is, uh, has gone out. It's in the past tense. Okay, so it's a completed action in the past that's fully done, okay, from the moment it was created. So everything that God has created was done in its entirety in the six days of creation. God didn't get things started and leave it up to natural forces and evolution to take care of things. He created things completely, fully, in its forms that he wanted, and nothing more needed to do, be done to have what we have today. He created it all in its entirety back then and there and has borne witness and it's borne witness to him from the very first moment, the very first time that the very first people, Adam and Eve, laid their eyes on it. And it continues to communicate to us today. Now, that's a lot of information. So before we transition, let me just quickly review here in simple terms what we've just talked about. Verse 1, David asserts that God reveals himself and he's revealing himself in the natural world, choosing the showcase of the skies. Secondly, in verses 2 and the first uh, verses two through the first two lines of verse 4, we learn about the nature of that communication, and we learn about the extent of God's revelation through the skies. It is continuously and abundantly communicated without a word, That's its nature, continuously, all the time, abundantly overflowing without saying a word, and it's a universal testimony. No one can escape from the convicting power of this universal testimony. So now David, in the last verses here, is going to start to appeal to the sun. So why do you think David chose the sun? And remember I asked you to think about the link between the skies and the sun when we started a bit ago. And you probably have already grasped it, what it is, or maybe you have your ideas, but here's my answer. Um, David chose the sun not only because it's placed in the expanse on day four of creation. We learned that in Genesis chapter 1, 14 to 19. Not only because it's the most prominent aspect that we can see in the sky, uh, but and not only being a, a, a perfect complement, but also because it provides the very same universal testimony as the skies do, right? Pretty neat. Now, let me assert, I'm off script here, okay? This is not in the scripture, okay? I can't tell you really what's going on in David's mind, right? So I'm not going to dogmatically assert it, but I think it's an interesting way to think about it. I think we should be thinking about why he chooses the sun. Why does he use these images? Um, but I do think it also it, it, it nicely fits the context. So anyway, that aside, David will now use the radiance of the sun to illustrate God's silent communication in creation. So let me go ahead and read again from verse 4c, the third line of verse 4, through the end of verse 6. David says, In them, meaning the skies, He has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its extent to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, I've got to admit that um, sometimes I think it's easy for us to marvel at the creation and lose sight of the creator. What I particularly like about these verses here in this uh, first section of the psalm is how they get us thinking about the attributes of God. So we're going to learn some attributes of God in in these verses. David's going to point to four characteristics of the Son that I think display or point to for attributes of God's very nature. The first one he starts with in verse 4c says this, 
the Son sovereignly display, I mean, God is sovereignly displayed in the Son's subordination. Okay? Look what it says. It said, God placed a tent in the sky for the Son. It introduces this other part of creation, the Son, illustrates God's sovereign control over the Son. So God created the Son, right? He has sovereign control over it. So let me say it simply. The Creator rules over His creation. Everything God made is subordinate to Him. Everything. So in line 4C, David is demonstrating God's sovereignty over His creation by saying that God is not, has not only created the Son, but He also has given the Son its home the tent of the sky. Now, he's probably also trying to kind of convey through this imagery the the sun setting, so when it's in its tent, there's the darkness associated with it. But I like the idea that he has created the sun and he has sovereign control over the sun, how it works, how it runs its course, and he creates the very home for the sun, which is the tent of the sky. Now, in David's time also, sun worship was prevalent in Egypt and other pagan religions, But why, uh, and I don't think David's major point really is to attack these religions or their false gods. I do think he provides us with an important reminder not to worship the creator, I mean the creature, over the creator, right? Didn't Pastor Mark read that to us this morning in chapter 1? What does it say? Verse 25. He said, Paul says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. So I think this is an important reminder for us. Even as mature Christians or wherever we are in our Christian walk, we have to guard our hearts against the propensity to worship the things of creation over the creator himself. Right? I, look, I, I love the creation. I love sitting at the beach. I love seeing the waves roar in. A little shout out to our New England brothers here. I like waves that are big, not like these little lap pool waves of our Gulf Coast here. But, you know, it's marvelous. You know, you watch the tides. In New England, at least, you can really see them. They move six, eight feet. I'm all, where'd the water go? Went away, came back. I mean, it's just marvelous things that we see about it. But we don't worship that. We rejoice in it, right? We rejoice in the creator God that's behind it. We don't rejoice in the material things of the world, right? God provides us places to live. He gives us food to eat. All of that comes out of his creation in some form or fashion or out of our creativity and what we've learned to do. But we don't worship those things. We have to remember that the point of all these things is to point us back to our creator, God. So um, in every instance, these desires um, of the heart are really a poor substitute for all that we can have in God alone. Now, next, what we're going to see in verse 5 is God's omnipotence. That is, his all-powerful nature displayed in the son's vigor and in the son's vitality. Now, this was a kind of a tricky verse to kind of to, to unwind, and I, and I think we had to think about it a little bit. But David gives us two illustrations, and again, these two illustrations in the first and the second part of the line work together, Okay. Both the illustrations, the bridegroom and the strong man, present us a picture of youth and of strength and of vitality. Okay? Now, just like the bridegroom, the sun emerges from its tent each morning and it rejoices like the strong man to run its daily course. The illustrations convey the idea of an enthusiasm that never tires and delights in fulfilling its appointed task. But there's also a very clear sense of power associated or about them. So in a similar but infinitely more efficacious or effective way, God himself is all-powerful. He is able to, and he rejoices in uh, revealing himself and fulfilling his covenant promises. This is an important aspect of our God. He's not just saying this to say it. He's saying it to reveal it so that we'll embrace it and that we'll own it and he's going to promise to fulfill it. God is utterly unique in his ability to completely and perfectly accomplish everything he promises. The theologians again call this his all-powerful nature, omnipotence, and it defines his ability to do anything 
that is consistent with his nature. Now, note the qualifier in that statement. Anything, but it's got to be consistent with his nature. Okay? So, why, why qualify it? I mean, are there things God can't do? The answer is yes, right? We know he can't, okay? Uh, Psalm, or Numbers 23, 19 says, God's not a man that he should what? Lie. But God can't lie, right? Can't do that. Uh, another thing that's important, which kind of leads us to our next point, is God can't what? Change, right? Which leads us to our point. God's immutability, his unchangeability, is displayed in the Son's persistence. In verse 6, look at the first two lines, okay? They say it's rising, referring to the sun, is from one of the heaven, and its circuit is to the other end of them. It's a persistent cycle, right? Happens every day. Repeats itself the next day and the next day. Um, in the first two lines, David's going to describe the perpetual cycle of the sun using an everyday observable occurrence. We might paraphrase it this way. The sun rises sunsets every day, right? Goes forth, runs its course, does it again the next day. Uh, the sun completes its cycle each and every day with reassuring regularity and without becoming weary. And just think about it a minute. Think about it. When's the last time you went to bed thinking, boy, I don't think the sun's coming up tomorrow. You ever thought that? I think a lot of things before I go to bed, that, that one's never come to mind, okay? Because we know it's going to. Well, why do we know it's going to? Well, God promised it was. Where did he promise that? Well, way back to Noah, back in Genesis, right? Remember after the flood, God made a covenant with Noah? And in chapter 8, verse 22, he says this. It's a unilateral promise. While the earth remains, okay, so there is a qualifier. While this earth remains, seed time and harvest, seasons, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So it's a promise, right? God's immutability, he can't change, he has to do it. So we experience day, we can experience a day without sunshine, but we cannot experience daytime without the sun, right? So God created to rule the skies. We learned that in Genesis 1.16. Like the sun, God is equally and more reliable, revealing his immutability. God's immutability, like the sun, regularity means he does not change his course. Right? Theologians have a fancy definition that says he doesn't change in his essence, his essential qualities, his purposes and his promises. I like the layman's de description. It says simply this. Uh, and, uh, God is unchangeable in who he is. His plans and his decrees are set in stone and they're not going to change. And his promises will be fulfilled, each and every one. Now, I don't know about you all, but I'm surely glad that I don't have to place my faith in mankind, particularly when we consider how mutable or changeable we are. Compared to God, we're downright flaky. Right? Now, I'm sorry if I insulted any of you, but you all know it's true, right? So even the most reliable person among us is a mere shadow of God's reliability. Well, now we come to the last line of verse 6 and our final point here. And the final attribute of God exposed through the sun, and that is God's omnipresence, is found in the sun's rays. David says it this way, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, the sun's rays transport both its light and its heat. And I love this final image. I struggled a bit to understand why David used heat and not light, which is a far more frequent metaphor for God in the Bible. Uh, either one would have been fine, but heat, I think, is ever so slightly more universal, right? I mean, um, it's ever lit more, uh, more slightly. So um, light exposes things, but no matter how hard a blind man tries to see, he can't see light, can he? Or for that matter, if you're really well blindfolded, you can't see the light either. You're physically able to see, but you can have the light blocked. On the other hand, everyone feels the, the sun's heat. You can't escape it, right? You know, we've got some brothers here that uh, make their living outside, and I'm sure they'll test a quick amen to that. It's hot. 
Outside. Okay, thank you, Clint. I knew I'd get you for that one. Now, even the blind man also can surely feel the heat. Okay? And uh, 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 remember that uh, David uh, also wrote this psalm sometime in his lifetime, maybe around 1000 B.C. We don't really know when. So I'm pretty sure David didn't have any air-conditioned buildings. So he's writing from his own experience. And even though he could have sat under a tree or maybe hung out in a cave, we know that you really can't, can't ever escape the penetrating heat of the sun. It's impossible for us to hide from God's presence. He's everywhere, okay? He's fully penetrating. So turn with me real quick here to Psalm 139. Let me read verses 7 to 12 because they really say it better than anything I can say with my human words. So Psalm 39, we see all three of God's O's here, omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. But we see his presence highlighted in verses 7 to 12 where it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So our God is everywhere. Really can't say it any more clearly than that. So... That was a mouthful. Appreciate your patience and listening, but let me offer just a couple quick thoughts here to close this first section of the psalm. At the very least, we ought to conclude that general revelation is a powerful witness. We can confidently point unbelievers in creation uh, to creation as God's testimony, and hopefully the witness of the heavens will create a hunger that causes them to think about who and what is behind creation and then in turn pursue God's written word. Uh, Yet sadly, and more often, mankind suppresses the witness of creation into their eternal peril. Pastor Mark read about that this morning, verses 18 through the end of the chapter. Not ashamed of the gospel, but what do we do? It's there for us to see, but we suppress the truth. We try to say it's not so. So if you're here with us today, and you have not yet, and I emphasize that word yet, because I hope you will, place your faith in Christ, then you need to heed what Paul says in Romans and what David says has said here in verse 19. And please do it now. You may not, indeed cannot, be saved by what you observe about God and creation, but I urge you to take heart the fact that God's witness in creation is enough to convict you to eternal damnation. My appeal to you is that you do not perish and you don't persist in suppressing the truth, take heed of God's invisible attributes that are revealed in creation, and pursue saving faith in him through the word of his scriptures, which we'll talk about next week. And for most of you who are here today who are already among God's family, I want to really encourage you with this simple statement. Don't be afraid to proclaim the truth of creation. Okay? Don't be afraid, because God does. Right here in the word, we saw it this morning. Or maybe said a little differently, don't be afraid of science and those who might ridicule you for your beliefs about creation. You know, personally, I love science. Think about it for a minute. I love that scientists can help us understand how God's created world works. Everything they discover keeps pointing to a creator. Can't make this stuff up, as they say, okay? Uh, How the world works. It generates amazement for God and who he is and what he made. I also love that medical scientists look for and find cures for hideous diseases. Okay, when I'm sick and there's a pill, I want it. I'm thankful for it. Okay, so I'm happy about that. I'm happy when astronomers can tell us and explain how the night skies work. I'm fine with almost any scientific work that is done to explain the various aspects of creation, focusing on how God's created world works not some dogmatic theory that they've come up with about how it came. That's when I disconnect with it. So don't be afraid of science, okay? Science also points to our creator God, the very God of the universe who displays himself in his creation. 
We don't worship the creation. Instead, we rightly worship the creator. We glorify him and we enjoy him forever. Let's end in a word of prayer. Father, I, uh, I thank you for these marvelous words of this psalm. Thank you for the fact that you don't hide yourself, that you show yourself to us. You show yourself marvelously and continuously and abundantly. And, and I just go on and on and on with the lees, all the different ways that you, Father, show yourself to us through your creation. Father, it's a marvelous creation, but I, I'm also reminded to guard my heart that I don't worship the creation, but I use it for as you intended it to draw me to the creator, to you and to your son, Father, who you sent to save us and atone for our sins. We thank you for the word this morning. Thank you for all that you give us through your general revelation, and we look forward next work, week, Father, to what you'll tell us about what you reveal about yourself in the scriptures. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, as is our practice at the beginning of each month, we'll take a time to reflect on Christ in our communion service. Now's the time for you really to prepare your heart. Um, each time we come to uh, take of the Lord's table, it really is on you to prepare your heart. We do what we can in that. We sing. Uh, we have a time of prayer. We have a time of fellowship. Uh, we have a time of the preaching of the word. Uh, we can control those things. What we can't control is your own heart before the Lord, how you think, what you think, what you think about Christ as we look at the elements. What's interesting, when we come and we're going to take of the Lord's table, we're going to take of the bread and the cup, these are symbols of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not Christ. We're not presenting to you Christ. We're not breaking off a piece of Christ and giving him to you. We're not draining the blood out of Christ and giving you a little blood. We are representing the Lord Jesus Christ when we take of this cup and we take of the bread. And we are drawing you to Christ to think about the significance of him. Because without Christ, none of us are in this room. Without Christ, none of us have the hope of entering into the presence of God. Without Christ, none of us could look even at creation and enjoy our Savior and our God. Because without Christ, we wouldn't acknowledge God. Uh, that's ultimately when God sent Christ into this world. He opened up our eyes to see that God loved us so much that he'd be willing to pursue us uh, and that he sent his only beloved son to die on our behalf. So as, you, as we begin to uh, have the men come forward and, and pass the bread, men, you can come up for that. Prepare your hearts now. Confess your sins that you would take of the Lord's table in a, an acceptable manner, not an unworthy manner. Let's uh, worship as the men pass the bread.
I think of Luke chapter 22. Luke records the words of our Lord there as he had brought the disciples together. John records and even adds some details to it. John has said that as they prepared the room and they got everyone together, Jesus started the whole Lord's Supper with washing each and everyone's feet. Went around the room, there would be Judas and everyone else. They he wiped, he washed their feet, cleansed them. Begins to lay out for them this last supper that they had together. Luke records these words in verse 14. He says that when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. One little kind of indication there that he was already starting to reveal to them what was about to take place. They didn't know that he was about to suffer. Uh, As he says in verse 16, For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. It's rather interesting there as he's saying to them, This is my last earthly meal with you. My last time that I will eat of this Passover, the last time I'll have this earthly supper. And then this launches into then the Lord's table that we're now about to take. We come and we take of this table. For us, we are anticipating what is to come. All of us, for us, we're we're just symbolizing this future event that is about to take place. And we're reminded of a couple details. We're reminded that it is this meal because that reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. He breaks out, and the first thing he breaks out is the bread. Notice what he says down in uh, verse 19. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He, he started to remind them of himself, of his sacrifice of his own body that had to be broken. So when we come and we take of this cracker, which is a reminder, this bread, this unleavened bread, which is a reminder that it is of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a communion with him. You have a communion with him that goes beyond just a theoretical communion, which I understand intellectually, Christ. You have a communion with him that he is now, you partake of him. You take him in. Uh, He transforms you. So this symbolic representation Take it in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we indeed are so thankful that while we were yet sinners, while we were still rebellious, while we were self-seeking and self-serving, you came and you died for us to provide us a way of salvation. That you laid down your life, your body. You gave up of your will You gave up of your personal comforts. You gave up of the glory that you had with the Father, the the glory that all the angels acknowledge you. And you became a man, a servant, laying down your life for us. As we come this morning, we come to recognize that and we thank you for everything you've done for us. We're thankful that you did sacrifice your body on our behalf. We're thankful that you did obey the Father in all things. We're thankful that you have... uh, cared for us enough to patiently and long suffer to suffer long with us that we would have eternal life and we come again thanking you that you brought us together and we anticipate that time in which once again you will have a communion a fellowship with all of your people collectively together the marriage supper of the lamb where we'll all come together having one meal together rejoicing in your accomplished work. Until then, prepare our hearts in anticipation for that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Ask the men come forward and to pass the cup.
Again, one of the most significant aspects of the death of Christ is the fulfillment, uh, the satisfying, really, of the wrath of God. He laid down his life. He became the propitiation for our sins. He took upon himself all of God's fury, all of God's anger, all of his wrath against those who were disobedient, those who were stubbornly obstinate to, as we even heard this morning, the general revelation of God, or even of all of God's attributes fully revealed uh, in the creation. Man rebelled and is without excuse, and God's fury is justly upon them, and Christ took that wrath upon himself and satisfied completely the wrath of God. We come in Christ, we come now having taken of this cup, reminded that in his blood is the satisfaction for sin's debt. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We take of this cup and reminded that he satisfied God's wrath on our behalf. Take it in remembrance of what he's done. Lord, we could not even begin to imagine what you had accomplished there on the cross. For the wrath of your Father, you had never experienced in all of your eternal life. To think that you had perfect communion with the Father before anything ever existed, perfect communion through your entire life here on earth, and finally at the cross, at that brief moment where you were coming to the end of your earthly life, to cry out, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? The kind of grief and agony that the eternal Son of God, you as our substitute, had to bear for us is unimaginable. But it is in that sacrifice, that separation from the Father, we recognize the seriousness of sin that you would love us so much to take on that wrath that we couldn't possibly have bared with an eternity of lifetimes we could not have possibly paid back. We're so thankful for your willing sacrifice on our behalf. And so as your people, we come together to give you praise and adoration for all you've done for us through Christ. Thank you for laying down your life for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We think uh, the most... You know, fitting response to all of this is that song that the children started with this morning. So please stand. We're going to sing Our Soul Arise. And, uh, you know, you heard them right at that point when they got to the chorus. They, they belted it out. So I'm expecting some matching of that. So I'm expecting you to belt out there when it comes to the chorus. So let's sing together. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for a time of worship this morning and pray the Lord blesses you on your way out. If there's anything we can do for you, if you have questions, uh, uh, concerns, you need to pray with someone, please come forward. We'd love to uh, help you. Lord bless.